Aloha, everyone. This is Larry Camp, and welcome to the Nobody Knows Your Story podcast, which just happens to come with a side of Hawaii Ana. Nobody Knows Your Story is a podcast which I believe will impact each listener in a positive way. As you listen to the experiences that have transformed, shaped, and guided each guest, perhaps you'll better understand your own personal journey. Some will surprise, some will make you question, and some will inspire, but all will leave you in a better place for listening in. As for the Hawaiiana, well, that's just a big part of my life story. So I invite you to check in from time to time, or better still, add Nobody Knows Your Story to your list of favorite podcasts. You'll enjoy hearing the life experiences of people just like you. Of someone who's worth kissing Wahine from Waimea See the sunlight hit the valley Wahine from Waimea You can almost see your hale You've been gone for so long you've forgotten Makua Kane had told you so often Treat aloha and your ohana As your most important kuleana Battles you are fighting Wahine from Waimea I think it's time to let some light in Wahine are talking to you now And they'll help any way that you allow And they'll navigate through if you listen To the part of you that you've been missing Wahine from Waimea You're back home Wahine from Aloha, everyone, and welcome to another walk down memory lane. Hey, if it sounded like I emphasized walk, well, that was intentional, and it's going to make some sense as you listen to this episode of the Nobody Knows Your Story podcast. Now, we just heard Wahini from Waimea, performed by Tayana Tully and John Cruz. Mid podcast, we're going to hear Old Style Way by the Hawaiian Style Band with Wade Camber. Now, I say Wade Camber that way because he's a very instrumental part of that band, but also because if you haven't heard it, Wade was a, uh, well, he was a guest on the podcast back in March of 2021. So you want to check that out. We put a lot of the songs from the Hawaiian Style Band in that episode. Now, I said I emphasized walk intentionally, and that's because Frank Ring, my guest today, well, he does a lot of walking. And as he tells his story, walking just might come up a time or two. Let's scratch that. It's definitely going to come up because not only is he a big time advocate of walking, so am I. (laughs) We're going to be talking about it. (laughs) Frank, welcome to Nobody Knows Your Story. Great, Larry. Thank you so much for having me on here. I I love the emphasis on walking right away. Even before we started this, we were chatting and, you know, I got my walk in today. I had to abbreviate a little bit because I had to go to Costco, but hey. Got some steps in at Costco, too. <laughs> oh, th- those big box stores are a great place to get a lot of steps in. <laughs> I have and, a friend that lives up in the northern part of Salt Lake, uh, or I'm sorry, the northern part of Utah, up in the Salt Lake Logan area, somewhere up there. It gets a lot of snow. So what they do is they go and walk in malls during the wintertime. Right, you know, we're right. lucky. I'm lucky where I live because I can walk outdoors almost every day, but some right. people can't. No, some people can. In fact, on my on my website, I did a uh, blog post about mall walking. It's oh, there the you go. Title of the article. I'm in North Jersey. Um, I grew up in Palisades Park, and the winters are cold, um, not too bad, but they get slushy. They we're in that area where 
it, well, it gets snow one day, then nice sunny day, and everything turns to mush and slush. Getting out to a mall is a great place to get your steps in. You just stop in the malls just to you know have a cup of coffee and just actually get stretch my legs inside mm-hmm. the mall. Just you know, it's just a nice atmosphere, sure. especially around Christmas time. Do some Christmas shopping, get a little walk in. So I'm like, hey, let me do an article about this. Palisades Park is, uh, let's see, the, the George Washington Bridge, if everyone's familiar with that, comes over into Jersey, into Fort Lee. The next town is Palisades Park. The next okay. town south of, of Fort Lee is Palisades Park. So I grew up three miles from the bridge. My parents' house, the Palisades Park is very hilly, and we're at the top of the hill. My great-grandfather settled there in 1906. And from the top of our house, from the second floor we lived, I could see the uh, the, the tallest buildings in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, but I was never, uh, growing up, never a big uh, city guy. I never really went to the city a lot, even though it was so close. Lived with my grandfather. So in the you know, late 60s, when I start, you know, have memories of, you know, the 69 Mets and everything, New York City was in really bad shape. And he had the news on all the time. And as a kid, I saw the worst of New York City because that's all the news projects you know exactly so so as a kid I'm like i don't think i really want to go over there much so you know i used to do deliveries when i one of my jobs that i had but you know i really have stayed out of it a lot but um living in north jersey a really nice suburban uh place to grow up palisades park was really nice so you grew up in palisades park you you did your uh, schooling there high school i grew up stuff? in palisades park i went to palisades park high school class of 1981 i was a athlete i played baseball basketball we had some really good teams uh, great memories of sports in palisades park it was a big baseball basketball town this would be through the se- late 70s and i graduated in 81 i grew up like i said my grandfather settled there and uh, hit my great grandfather and my grandfather was the oldest of 10 his nine out of the nine siblings eight of them settled in palisades park when they grew up and got married Okay. So my mom grew up with like, I mean, there were dozens of cousins in Palisades Park. So me growing up now, the next generation down had so many relatives, distinct, like first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, whatever the numbers are. But so it was an interesting childhood where I could walk down the block and four or five different houses, I was related to them, you know, great place to grow up. Uh, good memories of Palisades Park High School. I was not the best student in Palisades Park High School. I was a quiet and sh- pretty shy kid and got along well with my teachers. I figured out the system of the, if I was quiet and didn't cause trouble, they would give me the benefit of the doubt during grading time. <laughs> so <laughs> it got me through high school. And then when I left Palisades Park, graduated, I said, I will never be back there again. Just, just no reason to go back. I never, ever thought I'd be back there as a teacher. <laughs> after uh, after uh, high school, Went to college for four years, had three years worth of credits, started a business, got married at 22 years old, uh, took a leave of absence from college. And I thought, well, that's it. I'll never get back there. A few years later, I'm like, I think I need that degree. So I had a coffee service. It was uh, put uh, off uh, coffee brewers and offices, delis, restaurants. And it was something I made some money from it, but I never, never loved it. You know, it was a job. That's how I, even though I owned the business, it was a job. So I got the degree at 30 years old and ran the business for a while. Then I knew I, I had to get out of it. It's funny, at my high school graduation, one of my mother's cousins said to me, hey, I'm going to give you some advice I give my son. When you hate your job three days in a row, it's time to get a new job. So that stuck with me. I mean, I was 17 years old when I got this advice. Now at the time, I'm like 33. And I had like three months in a row where I hated what I was doing. Now, prior to that, I always liked it, but just it ran into some just issues on uh, with the business. And I'm like, I got to get out of this. So I was glad I had the degree. I thought about teaching, which I had never, I saw an article in my local newspaper about the teachers. And I'm like, wow, well, I never gave that a thought to teach. And I said, hey, maybe if I got into teaching, I can get into coaching. And that's how it worked out. In Jersey, we do uh, something called a take the praxis test and get a provisional license. And then, um, you can get a job as a teacher, but you're also going to school at the same time. I had to take classes at night to get my teaching permanent certificate. Got hired in Palisades Park. It took me a year and a half to sell the business. I built it back up. Got hired in Palisades Park really as a two-month, it was supposed to be a two-month gig. So the superintendent said, I have a guy who teaches in the computer lab. 
your certificate is good for that. You can teach in there. His license, he came from out of state. The state, New Jersey, is not recognizing it. So he has to get the provisional license like you did. He has to just take that test. As soon as he gets it, you're out. But at least you have a few months of working and you can see if you like it. Hey, that's all I work. What else what more can I ask for? I show up for the job and the guy quits. He said, said to the principal, ah, you know, I thought I wanted to get back into teaching, but it's really not for me. He was older. And so the principal looks at me and says, hey, it's your class now. I didn't let it show, but panic set in because I was like, the idea of teaching was great. The actual, now I actually had to do it. <laughs> but like I tell my students, jump in the deep end and you never know what will happen. Frank, did you notice that the high school kids are a little different from the time you were in high school? So I started, this was at 35 years old. And when I took, when I got into school, I was like, whoa, this is very different than when I was here. It, there was just a different feel to the school. The kids seemed a little bit more, uh, I, I, maybe I just didn't, I hadn't been around teen. I, I started my business at 20 years old. I wasn't around, I was in the adult world very quickly. So I wasn't around kids and they were, they were different uh, then. But I find now it's 25 years later that they're, they're just like little kids. I don't know. It was, it's weird. I don't know. I, I've changed or they've changed, but it's, it's very different. I thought they were much, um, when I first started, like, wow, these kids are rough. I mean, I don't remember any of us just doing what the things that they were doing and stuff like that. But now the kids are like, we have a really nice student population. I really enjoy teaching it. My, my try, I tell people my biggest, uh, headache every day. No, not, that's not even the right word. My biggest hassle in class is I have a, a group of students, two or three guys, they laugh too loud. <laughs> they have a good time with each other. So that's my big problem of the day. Students who laugh too loud. So I don't have any problems at all in my job. You started out in the computer lab. Did you stay in the computer lab or did you end I, up going I, somewhere I, else? I, I did. I stayed in the computer lab they, um, back then. We didn't even have the, this was 1998. They didn't even have the internet yet into the school. So the lab had all uh, Macs, these big machines. Um, and I had to stay a day ahead of the kids. You know, because I, you know, I, I, the only computer work I did was with my uh, accounting software for my business. That's it. I wasn't designing brochures or doing any of that stuff or any kind of research on it. I stayed a day ahead of the kids, and they were the kids were great because, and I, and I was honest with them. I'm like, hey, I can't, I don't know everything, <laughs> but I'll figure it out by the end of the day, and tomorrow I'll have the answer for you if I can't get it right now. And they were great with it, and. They showed me things. Hey, Mr. Ring, this is how you do this. Oh, this is how you do this. So after a while, you'd build up a base of uh, knowledge. And then uh, the school asked me to teach Photoshop, which I tried teaching myself from a book. I couldn't figure it out. They sent me to a class for three days. In fact, the instructor was so good, I asked him if I can use his files. And I still, that's probably 22 years ago. I still use his files and it's him and his family. And I, whenever I do the, the project or the assignment with him and his family, I tell the kids, that's the guy that taught me Photoshop. That's one of my, that's my favorite subject to teach because the kids get it. If initially it's like, there's a lot going on in that program. And when they get it, it it's, it's really, it's, it's cool to see. You, know, you can see the light bulb go off. Oh yeah. And their eyes, I, their eyes get wider. I love 25 years later. I still, I love that seeing that. Now, because you've, you kind of stayed in the same area that where you grew up. Do you see a lot of friends of yours from like grade school or high school? Are they did they stay in the area too, or is it a little bit of no? A mix? It's they didn't stay in the area. Well, I've had actually the when I first started teaching, at one point there were seven children of my of relatives in the school, which was really funny. So it was a cousin, like a cousin that I hung out with his kids. His two kids were there. Another cousin's kid was there. My first cousin, Frank, and his daughter and son with it just that was great that was a great part of it but what had happened palisades park because it's so close to new york city the it, it got so expensive to buy a house there if you didn't buy a house like right away like you really can't afford it now so what the the town has changed over the years so basically a piece of property used to be 50 by 100 50 feet by 100 and it was a house, single family house the property got so expensive that builders would come in, knock that house down, put up a duplex. So you got half a house right. connected. Those duplexes now are going for like $800,000 per side. 
there's not a teacher in the district that can afford to buy a house. In, you know, that's just mm-hmm. the economics of it. And it's happened all over, mm-hmm. you know, so yeah. there are very few people that I grew up with that are still in town. Occasionally on a back to school night, someone will come in and like, hey, I went to school with your sister. I have a sister who's 14 years younger than me. So I'll see maybe some of their class, uh, some of her classmates. And a lot of them stayed in Powell Park because they stayed in their parents' house. Oh, my mom passed away. I have, I'm in living in the house, you know. Mm-hmm. So when you grew up, did your, um, was your family religious? I always ask that because I came from a very, you know, uh, high demand religion in religious family. So I'm always curious about other people, if they grew up in a religious setting or, or what, were you guys religious? And if so, uh, did you attend often? Uh, well, we're religious. We attended, uh, we, we were threatened to attend. My, my mom was like, you have to go to church. And I, I I mean, the yelling and screaming and I go to church and I, but she doesn't go to church. <laughs> but looking back, there were four of us, you know, and my, so when I was like 14, my youngest was born. So my mother uh, didn't have the time to, you know, get to mass all the time. Although later in life, she became very, uh, very religious. And I didn't realize how, how much so until uh, she had passed away in 2016, she had pancreatic cancer. And when the priest spoke, during her funeral mass, I was like, oh, wow, I, I found out some things I didn't know. Uh, so she she had a lot of faith. She definitely knew she was going someplace better, for sure. Uh, but, you know, she wasn't a, you know, in church every Sunday and, and like that. And once I got to be a teenager, then, you know, she no, you know, no longer got on my case about going, going to mass. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I only know my own experience, but I think that even though I'm I'm not religious at this point in my life now, I do think that there were some benefits, you know, that I, I picked up on. I mean, certainly you can always point out the things you lost out on all the time you spent doing this or that. And right. you know, I could have been doing other things, but I do believe that there's some some good things, whether it whether you um attend church regularly or maybe you're part of Boy Scouts or maybe you're part of an athletic team, which I know you were. So, I mean, I think yeah. there's some skills and some things that you can develop camaraderie, uh, understanding of how to maybe work with people that you you don't have anything in common, except you both play right. baseball or whatever it might be. Right. Well, it's funny you say that. I mean, I found that more in sports than I ever did it in church. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, being, you got it, you know, as it, I mean, I'm talking about when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, I went to the Catholic school down the block. And we had a 10 mass and everything. And it was almost like I, I just zoned out. I, I you know, when, when people talk about Bible passages and stuff, I mean, I know they read the gospels every week. I never listened to it. I just, you know, to me, I just zoned out. As I w- was older, I got more into going to mass uh, and then kind of fell out, fell out of that. But I'll tell you, I do pray every day. Um, I do believe that there's a, a higher power and I, I ask for guidance and i give thanks because i have a lot of uh, a lot of good things in my life and i don't know if that's uh, being religious i don't know what that is but uh i ha- i do believe that there's something bigger yeah and maybe that's just being spiritual spiritual you know, I'll, i mean I'll take, yes. because there's lots of people that are part of organized religions and then there's a lot of people like yourself that they believe in something they they believe in um like you say you pray and so you do that because I think you're spiritual and, and some of that's probably a holdover from your days of growing up and going to Catholic school. Yeah. A lot, a lot of is that like I, a lot of it was with my mom, even though, like I said, when she was younger, I didn't see when we were younger, I didn't see her going to mass, but I knew, I knew how much it meant to her, especially later on when, with her illness, she just had a different she had a way about it. She knew she was going someplace. In fact, her last words to me, I was, I'm ready to go home. As I was wheeling her, she was in the nursing home, I was wheeling her into a, back into her bedroom. She said, oh, I'm ready to go home. I remember thinking, well, no, I was going to say, hey, no, we're in the nursing home. And then I stopped because I knew what she meant. Yep. She had been fading and I'm like, does she really mean that? And I'm like, well, I'm just going to let it be. And, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, that night she went into a coma and I never, that was it. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we, but the, her passing was like, oh my gosh, was just such an incredible experience. And if your mom's passing could be positive experience, it really was because um, she lingered for like three days and the family 
all gathered around her because she was a very big fan. She was like the center of not only our family, but the, even the extended family. My brother wasn't going to come up from Florida, but he did got there just in time. And we just sat around and watched her pass. But it was so beautiful. It was, a, it was just an incredibly moving experience that it was, a, a, like I said, I don't know if you can call your mom's passing positive. It really was a, a su- such a left such an impact on me, and and I think it was because of the faith that she had, and she yeah. and and I knew that she knew she was going someplace. Uh, well, like you say, she's, she was ready, you know. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Let's talk about a couple things that I know are passionate. You're, you're passionate about, and and certainly give a little backstory on. To, notice, I said backstory there. Backstory, but yes. Let, let's talk <laughs> about very how, good, and, and yeah, you got into ru- or into walking. <laughs> <laughs> so how I got into walking, the backstory is actually <laughs> a backstory. So actually, my backstory is I hurt my back, uh, and through sports, I, throughout my life, I always had that. Uh, get a few days of being inactive or just twist it the wrong way. And it just lingered for a long time, lower back, nothing crazy, but just, uh, it always slowed me down and whatever. 2015, the fall, the New York Mets are in the world series. So I'm blaming the Mets for my backstory and here's how that happened. So I was um, in teaching. I was a cross country coach. So it's cross country season. It would work out with the kids. I get home, I get out, get my run in. I'd get dinner right away. Uh, my son at the time was in elementary school, so uh, middle school, so he was fine taking care of himself. I'd sit and watch the Met game, and those games run so late. So I'd be on the couch and I'd not prop my back up right. I wasn't taking care of myself. I'd fall asleep at an odd angle. I'm sorry, I'm moving in front of the camera here. I'd fall asleep at an odd angle, and my back just started hurting and hurting and hurting. I did what you're supposed to do. I tried to stretch. I did all the things. I tried to treat it. I heed every different thing. Wasn't working. So I went to physical therapy. So this is now probably December, January of 16. Went to physical therapy right in town here. I'll do this, that, the other thing. Come three times a week. See the chiropractor. This, that, the other thing. Not getting better. Just the pain. And I would tell them I was uncomfortable. And they'd say, oh, no, just keep going. Keep doing this. Keep doing this. I just, just fast forward a year later, when it flared up again, I went to a different physical therapy place. I said, Hey, I want to get this. I was through a hell here. I want to get this. And as soon as I did the exercise, she said, how are you doing? I said, it hurts. She goes, stop. She says, you don't do anything that hurts until we get you, we get the pain stopped. The first physical therapy place, just, I just, I felt like an insurance card. That's terrible to say, right? but that's what I felt like, especially after I mean, I, I had three months of physical therapy. I get home from a treatment and I'm on my floor, on my down, face down. My wife at the time comes in and says, are you all right? I say, I'm, I'm in such pain. I don't know what the hell they did to me there. Went to her orthopedic doctor. He talked to me for five minutes He's, and he knew exactly what it was. He said, I'm going to do a, uh, he said, let me check you out here. And he stands behind me and he takes my shoulder and he moves him slightly, just rotates him a little bit. He goes, how's that feel? I go, it's fine. He goes, all right, how about this? And the way he said this, he tilted my shoulder and it just triggered the pain. I'm like, ah, he goes, turns, turns me around and he whirls his finger around and he points, he goes, disc. I go, disc what? He goes, you got a disc problem. I go, I don't have a disc problem. He goes, he looked at me like, <laughs> like I was nuts. He goes, I think he was in business for like 40 years. He goes, I'm doing this 40 years. You have a disc problem. I go, look, I've been in physical therapy for three months. They gave me every test under the sun. No one ever said disc. They never heard that word. He said, you're going to get an MRI. He goes, and you'll see I'm right. I go, well, they never gave me an MRI. So I get the MRI, go back to the doctor, and he looks at it. He goes, ooh, ooh. ooh." I go, your patient doesn't want to hear ooh. He goes, no, this is bad. He goes, I'm, I don't want to have to operate on you. I go, oh my God, I didn't think it was this bad, but I was in a lot of pain. It, it altered my life. The pain in, in at the end of, like there was three months of physical therapy, the, probably the last few weeks of physical therapy. And then before I can get in to see the doctor and pain management was just awful. My, my whole lifestyle changed. All I wanted to do was get home from work and lay down on the floor because it was the only place I could be comfortable. It was really so. Uh, anyone who's 
ever had chronic pain, I, I feel for you. It is just awful. Um, like I said, it, it altered my life, how I felt, just everything. I mean, I, I felt like it's just a dark cloud over me. And before this started, you yeah. were a big time runner too. Yeah, I was a, a big runner. I'd like to, we'll talk about that. I'd like to talk about it in a little while. Yeah. But at the same time, now, coincidentally, my mom had pancreatic cancer. She had one year where she, she had this huge operation. She had a year plus where she felt really good. So she had one year of dealing with it and the surgeries and the chemo and the radiation. Then she had a year of feeling good. She looked great. She was so full of life. Now we get to the spring, the late winter, spring of 16, and she's, it's back, the cancer's back, and she says, hey, I'm done. I'm not doing treatments or anything. And that coincided with the, really the worst of the pain that I was going through. So I did research. I have a book that I'm almost done with on back hair and, and walking. And the research I did, the mind-body connection is just, I had no idea at that time of how uh, they're so interrelated, uh, you know, what you're going through emotionally and with the back. So along with the, the herniated disc, there was a lot of other issues going, uh, going on there. So f- to get through the back, I ha- finally had uh, three epidurals. And it's so funny. You go, he says, I'm going to send you the pain management. Oh, great. At least they're going to take care of my pain. You call pain management and they're like, oh yeah, okay, six weeks. I go, six weeks? I need an appointment now. Oh no, we don't have anything for six weeks. I go, that can't be. How can you not have the six weeks time? I said, I'll take anything you have whenever. So I got in two weeks later. Now here's the kicker. I go to the pain management and I meet with the doctor. I said, oh, we're going to do the treatment test. She goes, oh no, no, this was just a consultation. I go, come on. I said, I'm hurting you. You have to help me. Go, no, make an appointment. I make the appointment. Six weeks. I go, I don't have six weeks. I cannot. I, I was out of work because after he diagnosed me, I said, you got to put me out of work. I can't sit down at work. The pain is so bad that I cannot sit. I'm on my feet the whole day. So now not only is my back hurting, my legs are hurting. My Everything is hurting. So anyway, finally got me in pain management. Three epidurals. The first one did nothing. The second one dulled the pain. And then the third one I had on a Friday taking a family vacation to Maine. So a lot of driving. And I said, all right, I'll drive as long as I can. As soon as I'm uncomfortable, I'll, you know, my wife will drive. Made it to Maine and dropped them off. I gassed the car up and I'm walking, I'm looking around and I'm like, something's different here. Like, yeah, it was a beautiful day. I'm like, this is really nice. Something, there's something missing. And it was, the pain was gone. Just that last treatment just knocked it out. I decided after that, that, you know, I was too afraid to work out, to walk. I wasn't even walking then, to run, uh, to lift weights or do anything. I was too afraid of getting hurt again. Mm -hmm. So that was the the late summer. My mom passed away in in, uh, August. I started back to school. I started coaching again. I wasn't even working out with the kids. I just was telling them to work out. I'll meet you at the spot. I'm the water guy here. I'll take the times here, give them the workouts. And then I had an incident in, I bent over wrong at home. That pain in my lower back wasn't the pain from the disc. It's just that, you know, you strain your back. But I was like, oh, I should really call out, but it's too late. I got, they can't get a sub in. I got to go in. So I spent the morning just overstretch, just doing everything wrong that it locked up on me. I actually had it taken out in an ambulance to the hospital because I couldn't stand up. I couldn't move my legs. I couldn't do anything. I'm in the hospital. They're treating me with whatever painkillers and muscle relaxes they had, you know, was the protocol. And it took like another six hours before my back loosened up enough that I could actually get off the table and shuffle out of the hospital. And laying there, I realized I'm like, this is never going to happen to me again. It can't. I'm I mean, An emergency could happen and I cannot do anything to help myself. I made a vow that as soon as I was cleared of this and I can move again, I'm going to start walking with the idea of getting back in shape to start running again. And uh, once I started walking, just getting down the block and back was an accomplishment. And then a little bit further and further. And from my running routes, uh, I knew that the top of the hill in the, in the, um, is a mile from where I am. And I was like, when I get there, that if I can make that hill a mile, I'll be in pretty decent shape. Then I'll start running again. I started walking more and more. I'm like, I don't think I'm going to run anymore. 
because I started looking back at all my running logs and realized how often I was hurt. And that's how the walking uh, came about. During, I guess, a year or so of this inactivity or or less than normal activity, mm-hmm. there your previous activity, you'd put on some weight. You kind of got out of shape. And I think that one of the things you said was, and maybe it was a surprise to you too, that just the routine of walking helped you get your weight off. Oh, I, I, absolutely. One, it just made me feel good. Just to be active again, uh, to be not in pain, to be active again made me feel great. And then I'm, I'm like, all right. Now I'm active. I've got to start looking at my weight again to uh, start watching. I, I actually did the calorie thing. I, count, I, I wrote down everything, every calorie I took in 
and I had to cut a certain amount, you know, 3,500 calories in deficit and you lose a pound. And over, you know, time, the weight started coming off. The more I walked, uh, one, I felt great physically. The second thing was my, my, my mindset, because I had been so cloudy for so long from, from, from my mom's illness, through my back injury, you know, it just was not clear about anything. And now I'm out there walking. It's getting into the winter time. It is the winter time. I'd layer up, put a headlamp on, and bought a headlamp at Amazon, and off I went. And I'm like, this is really nice. So I had been a runner for years. Running was a way to keep the weight off, to keep in shape, and you know, to feel good. But I never felt good when I ran. I I couldn't wait till the run, for the most part, to where the run ended. There were very few runs I could ever think of where I said, wow. Is I have that runner's high, that feels great. It was usually, oh, I can't wait till this is over, but it was a necessary thing, you know, no pain, no gain, that whole type of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, walking was the total opposite of that. Walking was like, I look for, I started planning now routes that I wanted to walk to, different places I wanted to see. You know, I did a lot of thinking when I was walking. I listened to a lot of audio books, a lot of personal development stuff, took a ton of notes on my Apple iPhone, uh, the notes app, and said, you know, I need to do something with this, with this walking thing. I didn't know what, but I needed to, I felt like I needed to share what I'm doing with, with everyone. And I started a website and uh, the website is walking for health and fitness. There you go. Well, and, and we, we've talked a little bit. I started walking. I I ran three marathons in 2005 and I decided I was done with running because I could never get over the pain as a runner, you know what an IT band is. And yeah, I had yeah. IT band pain, severe. I, w- I even, after the first marathon, I went and had a guy work on my leg prior to the next marathon, you know, stretching me and doing all these things and give me some things to do at home. I had a roller that I would roll on my leg and all this stuff. So, you know, the gun goes off or whatever, and you take off running. Every time when I get to like mile eight or nine, it would start. It just got excruciating to the point that I, I had to quit running and then I would mm. walk, but I could walk like at a four or five pace with no pain. But mm. then I say, okay, I'm going to run down to that light pole. And as soon as I start running again, there it was. So I tried it three times and I said, you know what? I'm, I think I'm done with running. And then I started walking. So since then I've walked over a thousand miles a year, every year. And, and that's, you know, some people go, oh, that's a lot. What is that? Like a three miles a day? Well, you got to remember a lot of days I don't get out to do my walk. So on yeah, those days, yeah. you got to make up for it. So yeah, I think exactly. you and I are a lot alike. I think you track, you you know how many miles you're doing. You track yeah, your miles, yeah. you track how far mm-hmm. you go. And that's how I am. I've yeah. always been a numbers person. It's just numbers are weird in my head and I like keeping track of things. And so when I saw what you were doing with your walking, I thought this is a good way for us to talk about this and kind of maybe help some of the listeners to understand, because I think in their minds, you're not doing anything when you're walking. You're not really burning calories or doing not like when you're running from what I understand. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. Walking gives you about 75 to 80% of the benefit of running. Yes, exactly. And because you stay injury free, you, you don't have that downtime, right? You know, that's the best part. Like I look back on my running logs and I'm like, like, why didn't I see this pattern that I was hurt? I had hurt. Uh, I had a shin injury. It just was this pain. It was there for like two years. Like I did some running through it, but it held me back from running because oh, this pain, this pain, this pain. Then it would travel to my knee. Then I'd have the back would bother me. Then the foot would bother me. And I'd look through my logs. I'm like, what was I thinking? I really wasn't thinking. You know, it's just hey, I needed to run. Plus, I was doing, I was doing this thing. Um, I was running. I was tracking my running miles on actual maps. To uh, it was something I did as a goof on my to my students that I was first going to run from uh, Palisades Park to Florida. So it was the virtual run, Mr. Ring's virtual run to Key West, Florida, via Route One. So Route One runs comes over the George Washington Bridge, comes through Palisades Park, goes all the way down to Key West, Florida. My grandfather in the fifties took a trip to Florida via Route One, and he told me about it. And so when I said, "Hey, let me do this." I'll Photoshop myself along the way from images I find online, and I'll track my miles on maps. So I actually ran the miles, just not on the, those roads. Mm-hmm. And the kids would look and be like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm running to Florida. They're like, you can't run to Florida. I go, is that me? Is that me running right there? 
So is that the sign? Welcome to North Carolina. I'm running to Florida. And I just had such a good time with that. <laughs> so when I finally got to Key West, I'm like, you know, I like keeping track. And I liked the, the whole Photoshop thing and, and the way to track it. So I was running along the up the Florida West Coast, uh, west through all the states down there. I think I got to like Arizona, the West Coast. I think that's when my back injury started. I was running a little bit more, you know, uh, and then once I had to stop running, I did nothing for quite a while. And when I started walking again, I'm like, hey, let me just pick up where I left off on the maps and I'll just continue around the United States. So I went all the way up the West Coast to Seattle, actually all the way up from Seattle to the, the border of Canada. I actually have a picture, the border crossing up there. And there's, you know, I Photoshop myself in a picture there and then across the top of the United States. So every, you know, every, I track my miles every month and put it onto the map. The idea was to get back to the George Washington Bridge, Route 1, and the three miles from the bridge to Palisades Park, I was actually going to walk on the actual route, right? Of course, COVID hits 2000, the, the late winter, spring of 2020. So I was still walking during COVID, but I wasn't tracking it on the maps anymore. I just, you know, that crazy time, I just, you know, who wanted, I didn't even think about doing it. In the summer, probably July or August, I was like, oh, let me, let me see where I am on this walk around the United States. And I would have finished the walk right when the kids graduated in, in the late June. I think I have a exact, exact date. I think it was like June 24th of 2020. The walk would have been completed. It would have been perfect to have a bunch of students walking the last three miles with me. But COVID, it was such a, like I said, it was after all that stuff, all that walking I did and all the Photoshop stuff. And there was a letdown how I couldn't celebrate it because we weren't in school. COVID messed with all, with our lives for sure. <laughs> yeah. Helps a lot of plan, a lot of things that people had planned to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's sure. talk about what you're doing now, because I think it's very interesting, the books and different things, uh, sure, and, sure. And how the walking's really become, I mean, just a huge part of your life. Yeah, it's a, it's a, an enormous part of my life. So I started, like I said, I started walking and I started the website, Walking for Health and Fitness. And I'm like, I have to do something with this other than post, you know, hey, how to do different things. Here's a blog post, how to learn how to write a blog post, all that. I'm like, boy, if I could develop maybe a product or something that I could sell online to supplement my income, that would be great. Well, how do I go about doing that? I had different ideas and I'd listen to the different marketers. And the one thing, the one guy kept harping on, if you want to be taken seriously, you have to write a book. So I'm like, write a book? Like, I what do I know about writing a book? Who knows, who knows about writing a book? I certainly don't. If anybody looked at my English writing in high school, you would know I definitely didn't know how to write a book. <laughs> but for this idea I had for a walking program, I did have a complete outline of, of how I would present it. I had looked at walking books and I'm like, why do they go so far in the weeds with this stuff? Like get right to the point. So I'm like, well, if I ever wrote a book, I'd get right to the point. So that's what I did. So I wrote a book called Walking for Health and Fitness, the easiest way to get in shape and stay in shape. I sold the PDF copies through my website, didn't even give a thought to putting it on Amazon or anything like that. But I saw an article about that and I'm like, well, I could do that. And it sells, it sells on Amazon. A lot of times it makes it to the number one slot on walking digital walking books. Uh, and then it fluctuates. You know, that book's been doing well. And it's a real primer of walking, the benefits of walking, uh, the equipment you need, not how to walk. I mean, most people know how to walk, but how to walk for fitness and for exercise. And that's covered in the book. So I enjoyed doing that. And when I researched how to write a book, uh, I bought this, um, I bought a book about it. And one of the things they said in the book is be careful with this because it becomes addicting, addictive. And I thought, well, I'm just trying to get through one book. But when I had the first book done, now in my walking, I started doing um, body weight exercises. So I'd have my spots on my route where I get down on the floor and do, you know, push ups. Push ups are so good for the body and so difficult to do at first. So, I mean, just making it to 10 push ups at a time, I was like, whoa, this feels awesome. Then I'd increase that, but I was doing them consistently. And then I said, wow. What if I combine, well, I mean, this is working for me. What can I write about this? So I wrote a book called Fitness Walking and Bodyweight Exercises, focusing on push-ups, lunges, squats, and planks, things that you can do right on the sidewalk in front of your house or any place you stop, you can do those things. So that was so 
the addicting part of the book of writing the book, I, you know, I found it so enjoyable. After that, I wrote another book called uh, Walking Inspiration, more of the mindset part of it. The idea was to write a book, and I didn't even write a book, but to come up with quotes, a quote a day about fitness, walking, mindset. And I put it all together, I had all the quotes together, and I thought, I wouldn't buy this book. I mean, it's just a book of quotes. Like, wh- like why am I doing this? I thought, well, I, I don't want to lose all this work I did. How can I make it something that I would buy? And each month focuses on a different topic of mindset. So the first month, January, what's your why? And that's so important for anything we do in life, especially fitness. Why are you doing this? And really focus on that one question. The next month, February is, what are your goals? How to set goals? Why goals are important? So then the quotes of that month really revolve and enhance what the topic is. And then other months deal with more of the body weight exercises, things like that. So every month is covered with something more than just a quote a day. And I thought, okay, finally, I wrote the book that I would buy. And then, uh, and then it continued. I have a, a walking log book, which has a weekly insight to go with the, with the weekly log pages. So I've got everyone covered from you know the overall to the body weight fitness to the mindset and then tracking it. The, the takeaway for me on this is that you not only learn something that's changed your life and that's enhanced your life, uh, being able to have an exercise that is uh, free of pain, but now you're also sharing that with other people. And you know, that's, that's the great thing about, you know, doing podcasts or writing books is mm-hmm. that you're able to give people ideas as they're, somebody's maybe driving the car right now, listening to this, or maybe they're out running and they've experienced some of the same problems you've had, or I've had, and they're now thinking, well, maybe I'll try and walk because walking is great. And and just like you said, when I'm out walking, I'm, I'm noticing nature, but I am listening to podcasts. I am listening to books on tape or, or whatever music. And not that I didn't do some of those things when I was running. Actually, when I was running, it was just always music and it was kind of music. upbeat music to kind of keep yes. it going. But, but this, you know, I would have had a hard time probably listening to a podcast while I was running, but <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, but you're helping a lot of folks. And I think that's a good, that's a good takeaway too. You're help you've helped yourself. Now you're helping others. That That's, that was the whole, that's part of what a big part of what I want to do. And, and it's great when you get that nice email from someone who recognizes, Hey, and then they, Hey, you, you did this, you wrote this, and it's really helped me. I've lost weight. I'm feeling a lot better about myself. And that's it's rewarding getting that feedback. You know, and like I said, it's it is such a great uh mindset thing just to be out walking. And a lot of times I don't listen to anything other than, you know, the thoughts in my head, which is really great. That's what's helped me get so much clarity in my life. A little funny to talk about walking. So I've been dating this woman now, Peggy, for uh, about a year and a half. So last not this past September, the year before, we had, were dating a few months and she says, hey, I volunteer for my Lions Club and we do a 5K. Why don't you come and, and walk it? She said to me, because she she knew, yeah, obviously knew my whole story. So we get to the race and she was at the end of the race, she's handing out the medal. So I'm like, all right, well, I, I sign up and I said, I'm at the start line and gun goes off and everybody's running. These little kids are running by me. I'm like, I can't walk. She's right there. I got to run a little bit, right? So I start running. And I'm running, running. I'm like, I could run a little bit more. And then I'm huffing and puffing. I'm like, damn, I really hate this. So I stop running and I start walking. And then more little kids are past me. I'm like, oh, come on, you can run a little bit more. So I wound up running half the race, walking half the race. I was sore for four days from just that little bit of running I did. It was like, it, that's when it was like, oh, yeah, never run again. It's just, I could have walked 20 miles that day and felt great the next day. But that running of a mile and a half within that three mile, 3.1 mile race was enough to hurt me for, you know, for feel achish and sore for four days. Yeah, if there's anything else I got to say about running for anybody that's uh, <laughs> thinking about the differences, I've known a lot of serious runners. I have not known one of them that hasn't had serious injuries at some point. Yes. So, I mean, it, it, and it just makes sense if you think about it, the, the, the constant yeah. pounding on your joints and your, it's just, you know, it's not something that the body's really designed to do long-term. And when I talk long-term, I'm talking 20, 30, 40 years, right? You know, it's yeah, fine to uh, run in high school and stuff like that. But I mean, if you're going to do it for 40 years, you better, be, better be careful and you got to have a little bit of luck, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, exactly. Everyone I've ever talked to about running, same thing. They've always had so many injuries. 
Now, since I've exclusively walked, I only had one injury and it was my own stupidity. I stepped in a pile of leaves, but there was a, a branch in there and I rolled my ankle. So it wasn't the walking that hurt me. It was my own stupidity of stepping, just go around the, the pile of leaves. But that's how gentle it is on your body. And it's it's kept the weight off. It's kept my mindset clear. I, mean, I can't say enough great things about walking. It, it is so gentle on the body. And you need to be able to, to walk. Forget about walking just like we do for walking. And we go out for a walk with Walk for Fitness. You talked to, we, we discussed before this, you being at a, uh, one of the big box stores, the Costco. Mm -hmm. Even if you, you, you need to be in shape to park the car, walk across a large parking lot into those stores, which are enormous. Those stores are so big. And if you're not able to walk, you're limited now in your everyday life of, of being able to grocery shop, of being able to go someplace because anywhere you go, you get out of the car, you have to walk to it. Interesting story. My dad, in uh, my dad's 82 years old, in June, past June, had a heart attack. Heavy smoker his whole life, but always looked in good shape. Uh, he used to deliver uh, water bottles, those five-gallon bottles. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy, man, he has these, even at 82 years old, he is so strong. But I saw him in this in this in springtime, is slowing down a little bit, not looking so great, but uh, he attributed to different things. He likes to go to Atlantic City. Late nights down there, you know, a lot of smoking, but he had a heart attack. And, and I don't always encourage him to walk. Hey, Dad, you got to get out and walk. He goes down to Edgewater. There's a nice walkway along the Hudson River, but he his legs are always in pain that he said, I, I can't walk. He says, I, it's just getting from the car to the bench is enough for me. I like to just sit here and always encourage him, can't walk. He has this heart attack. Thank God it is a miracle he's alive. Quadruple bypass. So, we nurse him back to health. He goes to physical therapy three days a week. And now he's down walking along the riverfront, like further than I ever thought he'd walk in his life. And he's like, hey, I make it down to that place over there. And I go over there and I'm doing this and doing even at 82 years old, starting out. And he looks better than he has in years. So that's and, and the, the healing power of walking, too. He's, he's doing so well. And uh, he stopped smoking. Thank God. I think a big part of walking too and being physically fit is so that when we do get older, as we age, we can continue to be active and do these things. Yes. Like your example of just walking from the car to the store, to, that becomes very difficult if you have problems with your knees or with your hips or you need a walker or any of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's in my mind, I enjoy doing it, but I also feel like I'm enhancing my chance of being able to be healthy and active longer. And I think yes. as we age, that's what we want. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had a growing up, I had a great example. So, um, let's see, my mother's sister married my uncle Johnny, and his father was an avid walker back. I mean, I remember as a kid in the sev early 70s, seeing him in the neighborhood just always walking, which as a kid, I'm like, what, what is he doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> where'd he go? I'm a, teenage, <laughs> uh, I'm a teenager driving. I'd be driving up. Palisades Park is all hills. I'd be driving up the hill. I'd see him at the bottom of the hill. Oh, do you need a ride? Nope, nope. And he's always always had a distinctive way he held his hand. I don't have to get my walk in. He would say that all the time. The man never looked out of shape ever. He looked in great shape. The man lived to 95 years old, was never sick until the end where he had developed, uh, he had developed pneumonia. And basically, when my cousin went to visit him, he looked at her and said, you know, I'm done. And he passed away that night. So he was in perfect health his whole life, ate modest. I, his diet was, v was very good. Um, he liked the beer or two, wasn't a big drinker, liked wine, wasn't a big wine drinker. I mean, uh, was an excessive, lived a simple, healthy lifestyle and walked all the time. So that was always my example. And my uncle, who was like a second father to me, was the total opposite of that, <laughs> who had put a lot of weight on during his life and really struggled in the last 20 years of his life where had he just kept the weight off and been active and walking, would have been, I, he would have enjoyed those last 20 years a lot more physically, you know? So I have that in my mindset going forward. I want to make it to 100. There you go. So, well, that's a good goal. You know? Yeah. Yeah. 100 and, and a good 100. The, the Mr. Astuni 100 of, of being, you know, fit and walking all over the place. And then one thing we haven't really talked about, but but I believe it, is that when you're doing these 
physical things, it's it's actually helping your mental side too, yeah. you know, with the clarity. Because I mean, it's great to be in good shape, but if your mind's gone, hey, yeah, <laughs> that's not too enjoyable either. So you need yeah. you need a good balance of both. So you need a balance of both, and you know, you walk up some steps or walk up a hill, and that gets your gets the blood going. You know, if if someone's out there thinking, "Now yeah, walking doesn't do it for me," go do some hills, and walking will do it for you. Yeah. yeah, and it's little things. Instead of looking for that parking spot closest to the door, maybe mm. park out a ways and just walk in and walk back out. So I mean, yeah, you don't have to if you don't have the time to maybe maybe do a thirty minute walk at least yeah. initially or whatever. You can do the little things like that. So yeah, the great thing I, I wrote on one of my blog posts is the benefit of a fifteen, just fifteen minute walk, and do fifth if you work all day, do fifteen minutes before you before you start your job. Park a few blocks from your job and walk to it. You know, lunchtime, instead of sitting in the cafeteria, get out and take a walk, which is what I usually do uh, at school. And then after school, another 15 minutes. You do that three times a day, 45 minutes of walking, and it just sets you up. The morning walk will set your mindset for the day. The mat, the lunchtime walk will keep the weight off and keep your mindset for the afternoon. You know, you don't have that lull of feeling tired after lunch. And then the evening walk, it's, it's you know, it's such a perfect exercise that is so underutilized. Mm -hmm. And now times we can multitask too. So if somebody's like, well, I don't have time to get that in because I've got it. Well, now you can a lot of times listen to things like we discussed earlier while you're walking. Mm -hmm. So I would advise not to be reading or looking at a screen necessarily yeah. while you're walking. <laughs> How you can step on a pot of leaves with a branch in it. <laughs> uh, that, yeah. I, I wish I could say it was reading. I just was, I was just, I'll step through this, you know. It's funny, this morning I took my walk and, uh, I had something on my phone I was looking at and walking, walking, walking and I realized that wait, wait, I've been looking down for like like several seconds, which is a long, it sounds short, but you cover a lot of ground and say, I'm like, what the heck did I just step over? Like, it's just, it's just mm -hmm. get, start looking at that phone. You really get lost in it. Yeah. So I advise not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if people want to check out the books, then things they go to walkingforhealthandfitness.com. Yes, walkingforhealthandfitness.com. Yep. Uh, the books are all on Amazon. So just type in my name, Frank Ring, Frank S. Ring, Frank Ring, walking, and they'll come up. I'm working right now, actually, in, in January, I plan another book to come out called Walking Works. And basically, I've done 20 podcast episodes. Each episode has a main topic, and the main topic is a chapter in the book. So it's a like an overview of walking and within the context of what you know what i talked about on the, on the podcast a lot of the podcast episodes are just me you know talking about the benefits of walking i've interviewed some interesting people in the podcast so that i in, in, included all of that in the book and what's the name of the podcast if people want to tune in oh sure it walking for health and fitness Every, you know, everything is walking for health and fitness because you are walking for health and fitness. It's, it's just, it flows off the tongue really nice. Frank, I put a lot good. of thought into those titles when I came up with this. Well, it's kind of like me. I do the nobody knows your story. Nobody, my website is nobody knows Larry Camp. So I'm with you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you got yeah. to have something yeah. that kind of lets people know. I'm, and, and when I meet people now, if they've listened to the podcast, I go, okay, okay. Now I get it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love this podcast idea that nobody knows you, but it's a great way to to just really connect with anybody. It really is, and it's it's fun because yeah, I just enjoy hearing people's stories. And for people like me, they're the ones that like to listen to the podcast. Yeah, they, absolutely, for sure, for sure. Well, Frank, hey, thanks again, man. Thanks for telling your story and talking a lot about walking because you know your story is interesting. Everybody's story is interesting, but yours had a little bit of a purpose there today in this talk story from the Hawaiian expression. And, uh, and that is to kind of tell people and introduce them to the benefits of walking. And I think you've done a good job of that. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me on Larry. And yeah, I could talk about the benefits all day, uh, because I'm an example of the benefits of it. And, uh, like, as I'm 60 years old now, I've never felt better in my life. I attribute it to walking, not only the physically, but the mindset also. Hey, so you're 60% way through your life now. I'm 60. Yeah, 60%. And, <laughs> you know, the next 40 are lining up really nice. I can't, I'm, you know, I'm excited about the future for sure. Uh, I've got a lot of good things going on and I'm yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks again, Frank. Appreciate it, man. Thank you, Larry. All right, everybody. Hey, tune back in in two weeks. I keep saying tune. 
like we're a radio show, but <laughs> check back in in two weeks. We'll have another interesting guest here on Nobody Knows Your Story. Aloha. Far 